Hi, everyone. This is Nicole Rivera, and you're listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. If you've been listening to Stop Writing Alone for a while, you've heard the term Happy Campers Club thrown around here and there. You may have even listened to episodes where I've had multiple members from the Happy Campers Club reflect upon their experience in the club. Happy Campers Club is a a kind of like an online event that I host at different times of the year where it's really intense writing community with daily meetings from Monday through Friday, all different themes. Every Monday is goal setting. Every Tuesday we do write-ins. Wednesday is casual chat. Thursday is a sort of sliding theme that goes anywhere from talking about the uh, beginnings of creation from brainstorming to plotting to structure uh, to being our critique day. Uh, And then Fridays, we always wrap up with a writing prompt party. It started back in April 2020. That was my first experimental Happy Campers Club. And it it turned out to be so uh, life affirming, not only uh, just as a basic writing community, but at that time, uh, the world was asking us to stay home and not see anyone. It came at the perfect time. Once that month was over, we needed more. And that's why the Happy Campers Club has continued on. And we are now about to go into the full season of Happy Campers Club in 2021. It starts next Monday. But one thing that I have been working on in the past year is writing my Stop Writing Alone book, which is all about writing community. So I've been drafting my perspective of what has happened over the last year, year and a half now, with this writing community, along with the writing community that I've had here locally, and all of my various experiences with not writing alone. But what I want to add to my book is a little bit of perspective from the people that I have been writing with. So I'm interviewing the happy campers one by one rather than the group setting that has been on the podcast before you're going to hear uh, some of the interviews as I record them which is partially for my benefit to get some notes for my book but also for yours to hear from writers just like you who were ready to dive in to stop writing alone And they found their path through the Happy Campers Club. And you're going to hear different stories. You're going to hear people who were all gung-ho and into bunches of different writing communities all along. And you're going to hear from people that were highly resistant to the idea of stepping into a writing community, either because of bad experiences that they had in the past or just because they had never tried it before. So I'm really looking forward to getting all of these different perspectives and hearing it from the writers themselves. So this week it begins with Joanne Artman. She's a memoirist. She's a f- amazing traveler and she's ready to share all of your her travel stories with you. You can find her stories on iconicbackpackerstories.com and that's also the name of her Instagram handle. Uh, but she's also dabbles in fiction and on this oh, promising us that she's going to return to her uh, fictional story that was downloaded to her as uh, as Melissa Gilbert talks to us about in Big Magic. But I'm going to let Joanne tell you the rest of the story as um, we sat together this week and had a great chat about writing community, about writing process, about her experiences with community before, and what it was about this experience that has helped her move forward. I hope you enjoy. Here we go. We have today Joanne Artman, who is one of the happy campers from the Stop Writing Alone community that's been going on since April 2020. And I want to talk to Joanne today about all things writing community and what she has going on. But um, Joanne, just really quickly, let the audience know where are you at and um, what are you currently writing? Right now, I am writing my travel memoirs. I spent most of my young adult years traveling around the world. 
um, before I got married and had children. And I've been really uh, inspired since COVID to write down the stories. It's something I've always wanted to do, but I found that I never had time having children. And so I'm pretty deep into the memoirs. I would say I have about 80% of it done thanks to your writing community. And I'm hoping to finish it very soon. I've even found an editor to work with. So Amazing. I'm pretty excited about that. Now, I don't know if I've ever actually asked you this. Do, how many years of travel is this covering? Like, I, is, is, was there like a solid strip of time in your life that was just travel, travel, travel? Or was it in between all the other life stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually started traveling pretty young because my father's from the Netherlands. So we mm. would go visit family. Um, but on my own with a backpack began when I graduated from college, which God help me was 1993. <laughs> and <laughs> the 90s. Uh, yes. And then I, I traveled pretty much up until the time I got married, which was 2004. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you, I, I, I knew that you had a lot of material to work with. And I was just wondering, was it like quick travel bouncing from place to place, but you're talking that was 11 years. That's amazing. Right. And I was a teacher. And so I would, you mm. know, like when I went to Thailand and Cambodia, I went in December and January, I would take the time that I had off and I would just be gone. Go. So yes. Yeah. While you were traveling, were you writing at the time? Were you documenting stuff? Was it journaling or was it, did you always have in your mind that, that this was going to be a book someday? No, I don't think I always thought it was going to be a book. I did journal the whole time, luckily, okay. because reviewing those journals has been key for creating these stories that I'm now working on. Um, it became a story when I realized how much it done for me. So mm. I, I traveled in my twenties and then the, the came home from a second um, four month journey. I was gone for four months yeah. and I, be, I became very, very depressed mm. and I was depressed for almost three years. I could not get myself out of this depression. Uh, the only way I could get out of it was, planning a trip to Peru. And so I realized when I was finished with that trip that that was this was the thing I needed to do to keep myself from loathing myself, from hating life, from from not feeling like I was in a place where I belonged. Right. And and so I would just then it was my medicine for yeah. many years. And then when I had children, it's just so darn hard to travel with small children and their car seats and their stuff. All the things. <laughs> yes. The first trip that we took with Alex as, as an infant, I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, my, my husband always jokes that, you know, I'm a ridiculous packer. And so like that first trip, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is not me. I promise you. I showed him like the corner of suitcase. That was my stuff. I'm like, he needs all these things all the time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, our first trip, we, we, um, we packed the kids uh, when they were four, we packed everything up and we took them to Disney World, which is in Florida. And it was a five hour flight and they did pretty good, but we still had to take the car seats with yes. us because they charge you extra per day. And we needed three of them. And, um, oh and so you should, if you could have seen my husband in the airport, with his bag and then trying to carry the seats. Yes, that's Poor madness. Man. I should not laugh at him, but God bless him bit, is what we'll say. Funny. God bless yes. him. <laughs> yeah, what an ordeal. So, so you realized while doing the travels that it was your medicine and you've come to a point now where it's, it's a story. Is it that bit that understanding of this is the medicine for me and like how did you sort of come upon a theme that you wanted to attach to this time in your life and said whoa this is a story or was it just about 
sharing the experiences with the world. So actually this, this is perhaps where I should begin. Did you start with your blog before the book or are those like sort of two separate entities? That's a good question. I did start the blog first. They mm -hmm. are two separate entities. Um, and I thought when I started writing the memoirs that they were just stories of my travels. Yes, I see. Yeah. And I came into the realization that it was my medicine. And I thought, if it's my medicine, mm -hmm. maybe it's other people's medicine. And I would love to hear their stories. Yeah, yeah their medicine yeah. stories too. Of course. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I want to circle back to the blog at, um, at a certain point, but you had said that part of why you are able to sort of bring this book out of you was working with the writing community, working in happy campers. How, do, well, first, how did, do you remember how you found Stop Writing Alone in the Happy Campers? Yes, I do. Uh, because I follow a woman named Lisa Murray. Yeah. Okay. Right. I love Lisa and her. Um, I have dreams. Damn it. Was it yes, that podcast? I have dreams. Damn it. Podcast. So good. And she, I want to say mentioned you or perhaps she um, follows you on Instagram mm -hmm. or I think it might've been Facebook originally because I, I came into Instagram rather late and I just, I liked your stop writing alone idea. And I would mm -hmm. listen to podcasts here and there. And um, when COVID first started and we were on lockdown and the kids were home, I um, came across a, a writing course and I took it and it really got the juices going. And I thought I need more. Mm. I need to keep going. And I don't know, the gods just were on Instagram and they pushed me to you and I saw that you were doing something. And I remember that when I first joined, um, I remember you saying, oh, I didn't even realize I left it open. Like I was like a squeak in at, you know, 11.59 totally yes. Pacific Standard Time and it was three was, in the morning for you. <laughs> yeah, I was like ready to roll. And, and I was like, I got my people, let's go. And then all of a sudden I got like a ping that somebody joined. I was like, people can still join? <laughs> what do they do? That's amazing. I mean, that truly is the universe, right? Allowing Definitely. all the things to happen. So, so what is it about this? You said you, you took the other course, you needed more. What was the more that not writing alone sort of provided you? Well, I, I wanted something where I could write and then have a critiquing component to mm. it. And, and so I had, of course, taken, you know, writing seminars through UCLA Extension a couple of times when I was working and trying to write some stories. And I found that 75% of the adults in that class were very harsh criti mm. critiquers. Right. And it left a really bad taste in my mouth because I was teaching young adults freshman composition and they were much kinder to each other. And I thought, what has happened in our lives that mm. we have to be like this to other writers? And, um, and so I moved away from that and I just kind of never found anything. And I, I don't know, I just decided to take a chance on you. You seemed like you had the kind of personality where you wouldn't let something like that happen. <laughs> yeah, that's not my vibe, but it's true. And now that you're reminding me, we did have that discussion a couple of times about the, the critique circles being this space of cruelty and almost like it starts to create blocks if you're constantly in that um, situation. So you did join us in the first session that we were ever trying critique. It was like, the, I, I remember that, that I, you had said you were looking for critique and I was like, well, timing has it, but this is the first time we are going to try because so, which, really intrigues me because one of the reasons I did not start out the happy campers with critique right away is because I felt the need for a trust to be developed between the people that were writing together 
to have a level of comfort and compassion to work with one another. So you're kind of a very interesting addition that you came in as soon as we were doing it. What sort of gave you the calm to to have that trust and compassion with this group of people that, I mean, you really didn't know any of us at that point. And we kind of started, I, I, I don't know if it was the first week or second week, we started critiquing right away. I mean, do you remember who you were first paired with? Yes, I was first paired with Susie, who oh, is oh, a that's very a, kind, lovely yes. woman. Yes, <laughs> what a great, <laughs> what a great man. I did it randomly, but that worked out really well. Yeah, right. And you know, it's it's funny that you say, "Was I comfortable?" Because I remember thinking to myself, "Well, here I am, the the you know, the the foreigner coming into the group. They're they're going to have to trust me, right?" Yeah, and yeah, so, right. I remember thinking, no, I can do this. I, mm. I do this. I did this for years. I would, you know, grade essays. And every time I had to give a grade that I didn't want to give, I mm. always started out with, these are the things you did right. Yeah. Here's why you're getting the grade you're getting. I thought that's just, that's how you need to do it regardless Absolutely. of the age of the person. Yes. So, um, and as far as you guys, I just, I, the fir- one of the first discussions I think I sat on was uh, Jackie going at length about her concerns of being, mm. having negative criticism too, because I think she also had some ne- negative experiences. And I thought, well, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Right. Yeah. It definitely was a conversation we had had for a while because with so many writers, especially at our age, we've been around you know, all different types of communities for a while. Unfortunately, that means many of us have had at least one uncomfortable, if not horrendous experience. So yeah, there was a lot of conversation around how we wanted to enter into this. Uh, I I love that. And I know that you, um, we talked last night about how not only were you getting that kind of um, critique and feedback and everything throughout the sessions of camp, but you have actually maintained contact with a fellow camper throughout the summer. Uh, How did that develop? Were you guys paired up at the end? How did you guys end up sort of sticking together? And I'm I'm talking about Tammy O'Quinn. Um, How did, how did the two of you end up sticking together for the summer going? Were you also, were you trading? You were also reading her stuff? Yes. So we were um, the last pair. Uh, in okay. June. And at the end of our critique discussion, I said, well, you know, if you want to keep going, I can keep going. And she said, yeah, let's do it. And we kept exchanging pieces mm. and it went until she fell ill with COVID and I hope she's Freaking doing better. COVID. Yeah. And mm. yeah, it, it just evolved from there and it was great. It was nice to have that accountability. It was nice to have that, oh my God, I got to do this for somebody. I got to get my stuff together and keep going. And how did you two, did you set it up like on a weekly schedule or was it just sort of when you can, did you do Zoom calls or? We did Zoom calls. We we kept it on Thursday, I want to (laughs) say. And yeah, we we kept going as long as we could. And, And that's the thing that's so important about your group. It's that, you know, continuous schedule. It's for me, it's been hard to find someone or some group where I can keep going with them. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's, what's so great about the community that you've created. I think for me, the part of the inspiration to sort of create it was that I had recognized that if I scheduled literally like all the things, if I scheduled time to write, if I scheduled time to read, you know, about the craft, if I scheduled it and put it on my calendar, like at the beginning of the week, then it was already in. But if I sort of like live through my days saying I'm a writer and I'm going to go do my writing and I'm going to do my reading, other things, uh, you know, all the other things, the pretty butterflies, the, the family life, all the other things would get in the way. So um, yeah, that's, that's part of the inspiration of the constant scheduling. It's just like, we're going to do this stuff on Monday. We're going to do this stuff on Tuesday. Just so it's like, yes, that's the day for this. So um, 
Yeah, yeah. I really, really love that the two of you have have continued. And that's that's always uh, my joy that the the types of connections that we create within camp um, find a way to to continue. So one of the questions that I kind of have for everybody that I'm I'm very curious about is I'm always preaching and saying stop writing alone. But I personally feel that there are times that you have to write alone. Do you have like a a certain part of the process that it's like, I don't want to hear from anybody. I need to just get to the page, whether it's like revision or, or drafting. Is there a piece that it's like, at this point, I don't, I don't want anybody. I need to write alone. Definitely. I find, you know, when we have our group write-ins that I can be inspired to produce a small amount of work, but generally I do write most of it on my own. Mm. And so that may mean sitting at a desk writing. It may mean sitting in my favorite chair in the living room. Um, I, or sometimes I even go to a cafe now that we're allowed to go back and sit in cafes right. and um, sit and write. But yes, most of my writing is done alone. Um, what the group does is it holds me accountable. Right. Like if I don't get this done, then what am I going to have to give somebody to critique? Right. You know, so that's what the group does. And it, it, it keeps the dialogue going. It keeps the juices flowing. Yeah. Yeah. For like, sure. so I'll be driving to the ballet studio as I do every day of the week. And an idea will pop into my mind and I have my phone. I tell Suri to write a note down and, you know, it's 75% legible when I get the note, but (laughs) (laughs) it's there. (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because I do find there are some times where the write-ins are so productive for me and I just go to town, but there are other times that I'm, I have a similar experience like you, that it gets me to the page enough to sort of start to trickle something out, but then I need to shut the camera off, disconnect and, and then give my, my, my brain really, it feels like space and time to, to sort of wrestle with it. I I do have to say I was near tears of joy last Friday because it was the first, not last Friday, the, the Friday before it was the first day that I was completely alone in this house since all of COVID. And then, you know, the family went back to, to school and work, but then we had, our air conditioning broken and they could not fix it. So they were here every day. So Friday, it was fixed Thursday afternoon, Friday, about 10 AM. I felt like I could think in ways that I have not been able (laughs) to process in over a year. And I was like, okay, this is really, now I'm going to get back into some real deep writing because I I have that extra uh, space to sort of stretch out. So I had a similar experience. Um, I would say last week as well. So my kids last week was their second week back in school. Uh, But that first week I scrambled about Mm -hmm. and kept walking in the house in circles as if somebody was here, as if there was some, some, there was an inevitable distraction that was about to occur. (laughs) And I, oh, and I sat down and I thought I have become so good at writing and ignoring them. What am I going to do that? They're not here. Yeah. But I have moved on from that. I have moved on, right, exactly. <laughs> I was really worried about myself the first couple of days. And then I was <laughs> like, it was like in a snap. I'm better now. I'm better now. <laughs> and I am much better. So, right. And now I can get things done without distractions. So things are happening much quicker. Yeah. So the work part is over. And here's this chunk of time to write. Yeah. So the only person to blame is myself if I don't do anything. Yeah. We're back to that old story now. Uh oh. <laughs> it's just on me again. Oh, no. So another, um, question that I'm curious about with, with everybody that I'm going to be interviewing is whether or not you have attempted to sort of create your own writing community. And I feel like it, you know, with, with you and Tammy, there's, there's something building there. You also mentioned uh, earlier to me that you have a certain aspiration with your blog and having people share stories. Um, So I'd love to hear about that, but also if there's any other experience that you've had with creating writing community? I'm sure even with your classrooms, 
you've you've sort of dealt with that kind of community building. So have you have you really taken the dive and and tried to sort of venture out on your own? No, I am too frightened to do such a thing. I that ne- those negative experiences weighed heavy on me for a long time. Yeah. So to create my own writing community, I, I, you know what? I don't think I would have known how to before joining your group. Mm. I think I know how to do it now. Right. Should I decide to do it? But I don't think I would have known how to, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I might've been the, okay, you know, no, no negative, harsh criticism. And then there would be the one person in the group who would say, but what if the writing really sucks? (laughs) Right. Right. And that may be the case, but how can we let someone know they suck nicely as opposed to (laughs) why can't we just be nice to each other? (laughs) So, you know, I just didn't want to be that person to have to, you know, I don't know invited in how to be nice (laughs) yeah no it's true there is that it feels as as though it could be a burden at times to sort of have that conversation but also if if you think there's no resolution to the conversation just inviting in the possibility of negativity when it's like I'm living my life without without all that negative critique why why would I so so then let me know then what's first of all where what is the uh website for your what is the url for your website and how can we find your your writing online and what is going on over there it's iconic backpackerstories.com cool and what's going on is i write different um blogs about my travel experiences I also have a page um, on there called Travel Adventures with Kids, because as you know, when you travel with children, there's a whole new dynamic of travel. Um, And yeah, so my goal is to start adding more to the blog and um, inviting people to post or share their stories eventually. I might even do a podcast one day where I invite people to come on and share their travel adventures, just to create more community in the world, because I feel like we need that, especially after or during COVID. And that's where that is. I decided to focus on getting my memoirs done first, because I felt like it would be a good springboard to have when inviting people to come and share their stories. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes so much sense. It's like, here's my story. Now I want to hear yours. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So uh, what are some of the countries that you've traveled to that people can look forward to reading stories about? So I've been around most of Western Europe, um, you know, Italy, Greece. I made it to Turkey. From Turkey, I um, went to Israel. I went to Jordan. Um, I've been to Cambodia and Thailand, been to Peru, uh, Guatemala, Mexico. That's all that's coming to mind right now. Favorite? What's, what's one space that you think everybody should see that you've, that you've been to? I don't know. I can't answer that. They all popped into my head. Right. (laughs) It's like all of them. Everybody should go. Why are you still home? (laughs) Get out there. Everybody should see Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Everybody should um, walk in the old city of Jerusalem. Mm. Everybody should go to a Greek island. Everybody should go to Istanbul. Yeah. um, Mm. Yeah. It's. I. I don't think it really matters where you travel. It matters just that you do travel, just that you do go out and you see the world and you see that you are a part of something that's so much bigger than where you are living. I think that's the most important thing. Even if you're just, you know, going to Mesa Verde in Colorado, there's some, we've been taking the kids all around the U.S. and we have had a great time doing it and just discovering places that are so beautiful um, and very spiritual and yeah. lots of nature. So 
Yeah, you don't even really have to go that far. You can just get in your car. Okay. And is that is that the medicine you think? Is the medicine the understanding that you're a part of something bigger? Yes, I, I, I think that is the medicine, especially for those of us who feel like we don't fit in mm. with a certain kind of life or, you know, group mentality that everyone seems so comfortable with. Right, right. Yeah, it's not, it's not all that's available. There's exactly. so much more. There's so much more. So we've, we've talked a lot about, I mean, I, I, I cannot wait to read the memoirs and go on all these journeys. And, and now I feel like I definitely need to get my butt out there, even if it's <laughs> close by far. I I've often said, you know, you talk about a lot of the n- natural spaces and one of my favorite trips of all time was here in the States, just going to uh, Northern California to Trinidad, going, walking amongst the redwoods and just, I mean, what <laughs> I'm, I'm a, an East coast gal. Like that is majestic. That is it's um, yeah. I they're, can't they're wait like to take my son there. Yeah. It they definitely feels like a very spiritual. At, yeah. My husband, um, he says, if I don't go once a year, it's like, I haven't gone to church. Yeah. So go. Yeah. It's the, it's the, um, the size is one thing. And then I was just so struck by the lushness of color. The green is so green. The, the, the trees are like this beautiful brown. I mean, amazing. And then you'll just come across a banana slug. That's like this bright yellow thing. And you're like, what is happening? This is just so gorgeous. So, um, so yeah, um, you have me just saying, asking myself, what are the other gorgeous things that I keep missing? But you, I know from our time in Happy Campers that you weren't just writing memoir all along. You have dabbled in fiction. What's the story there? Is that something that you're still thinking about or has the memoir sort of consumed you whole and you're just in love with this form now? Or is this something that you think you will uh, head back to, or are you still doing it while in between? <laughs> yes. So as you know, I received a download story, right. As right. Elizabeth Gilbert um, mentioned in her book magic, and that's what really got everything going. And so I was really just getting this novel down and, and getting the story down. And then in between where I felt like I needed a break, I would work on my travel memoir. And slowly they sort of took, they switched spaces for now I'm mostly working on the memoir. And I, in between I'll look and, and work on the, the novel. Um, so I, I still want to work on it, but I really want to finish this tra- travel memoir because I can see that it's going to be a really long process to get, yeah. you know, everything edited to add on another layer of this and then the next layer and then get it through this editor and then try to start submitting it. Um, and so I, I'm trying to do both, but it's, it's very difficult to try to do two pieces at once, but it is yeah. nice to take a break and work on another piece, especially when one piece is giving you a headache so my mm. chapter on Peru terrorized me the entire month of August. <laughs> <laughs> I could not, I could not get it out. Mm. I could not, but I finally did. And, um, and when I was really frustrated, I would just work on bits of pieces of the novel. Um, and I would just, just not even think about it. So they actually feed each other, you know, Yeah. Some, I, sometimes I'm writing one and uh, an idea will pop in and I have to, you know, switch over to the other document. So yeah, I'm doing both, but cool. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard about the, the novel in a while, so I wasn't sure if you had shelved it or if you were giving yourself, um, you know, those little, little breaks. I love to do the same. I mean, we talk about that all the time. It's like, if one thing is just really doing more harm than good to your whole psyche and create a process, then, you know, this is the, this is why I believe 
uh, you know, our muse provides so many freaking ideas all the time. It's so that you have something to play with to sort of feed the the soul so that you can come back to the thing that you are you are working on. So I'm curious, what was the what do you think, if you know, what was the struggle with Peru, with the Peru chapter? Was it tapping into that memory or was it just trying to translate it for the audience so, so that they were feeling what you were feeling? So Peru is the, the first place I went to after the major depression. Mm. So Peru is that first stepping stone out of the darkness. Yeah. And so it carries the most meaning because it, it lifted me out of the space and, yeah. and, and because traveling to Peru was really hard, you know, it climbing up to Machu Picchu, mm -hmm. um, Peru is a beautiful, beautiful place, but it is not the, you know, laying on the beach in Hawaii relaxation place. Right. Right. So <laughs> it's hard travel and it was really hard on me at some points and there was a lot of growth and a lot of a lot of spiritual growth I, and I went there for two months I mean I signed up to go for two months mm. yeah so I, there was so much that happened and I there was so much and actually it was one of those places where it was like too much that happened right. too much meaning and I had to sit there and think to myself okay which one do I want to write about which one do I think is the best one to expand upon and yes. i had to keep telling my brain no it's okay the other stories can live in the blog or they'll live somewhere else don't worry right i had to have this internal yeah. dialogue with myself that's really interesting because i think we we struggle that, with that with fiction sometimes that we have like all these different ideas and at the end of the day it's like well which one moves the scene and the story forward real you know the most powerful and you dismiss these other bits they go into some folder to be used some other time but when it's memoir when it's like what actually happened it's it's extra difficult and i i know that i've, I've spoken to many people who have um struggle with this idea of writing their story and leaving pieces out and that how am I staying authentic so I like that that conversation that you're that internal conversation that you're having with yourself like the, this is the one and those I will find a home for those other stories that I think is the wonderful piece you know whether you have a blog or something else it, it doesn't mean those those bits of the story won't go untold because it I think that's the, the thing that breaks every writer's heart. It's like, I have this beautiful story that I want to share. It can't go untold. This is the moment. But I'm wondering also if you have advice for any memoir writers out there who are struggling with a piece of their story, like you're talking about with Peru, that has difficulty in it. You know, the moment itself was difficult how do you revisit that time without bringing yourself, I guess, totally emotionally back? Uh, you know, like, an, a, I guess a sort of self-care sort of situation. So many people are re writing memoirs and stories about difficult, tragic times in their lives. And sometimes just, trying to sit in the memory uh is is heavy on its own do you sort of embrace that or do you have any practice to sort of help you through that process i definitely think it's important to share those raw emotions as mm -hmm. you're going through your memoir and the reason i think that's important is because that's the place where most people are going to relate to you Right. because everyone's had raw emotions and they're going to feel your authentic emotions. They're going to feel your hardship and they're, they're going to think, Oh, that shit happened to me too. Right. I don't feel alone anymore. Mm. I think that's one of the most important things um, to think about. And I always think, well, what would happen if I didn't do this? Right. I, I might have lived the rest of my adult life 
depressed. I might have really had to battle major depression in and out. And I, so for, for my situation, it's kind of different because I was able to find something that was my medicine. Right. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm someone who likes to do a lot of meditation. I, you know, like to spend time in nature. Um, so all of these things I believe help, but the process of sharing the story helps you remove yourself, not, well, not remove yourself from it, but gain an understanding of it that helps you move to the next step yeah. in your life gives you perspective yeah yeah for sure yeah but it is very upsetting and it's and I think that was the other reason why writing about Peru was so hard because you know I thought to myself well first of all the first feeling I had was as I was going through all of the travel memoirs, I thought, you know, you're such an idiot. You sat at home for three years doing nothing. You could have gone to China and you could have done, you could have really gone to Tibet and you know, you wanted to do that. I had this horrible discussion with myself, uh, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and then I said, oh, whoops, I, I shouldn't do that. That's not nice. Um, mm. You know, and so I kind of beat myself up about that. Um, but it's just, you know, the way things happen, um, and you can't change that, right? You right. just have to, so it was this sort of moment of acceptance that mm. I waited a really long time before I went out and traveled again and, oh, well, that's what I did. So you have to accept it and write about Peru. So I think that's another reason why it took me so I long. see. So you, you brought yourself back to this space of inactivity in the midst of writing a travel memoir and you're looking at this time saying I could have story after story after story and you were just sitting there but of course I mean upon reflection you you can see that you did not necessarily put two and two together that it was the travel that was the medicine I mean I think many people who uh, struggle with depression can empathize that when you're in the moment nothing makes sense you know like you can't see other options as something to do because everything's miserable that would be miserable too I don't want to lift my hand to go make a reservation to go anywhere so um yeah I think that's really what it what I often hear from the uh, memoirists is that going back you want to look back at your past clearly that's what you're writing about but then we're, we're always taught to not live in the past, to live in the now. So it's really difficult as storytellers to transport ourselves to capture the story, but not live in it. So I love your tips about staying in nature, meditating, because those are two practices right there that are being in the present, you know, just, you know, separating that, that research time and that time that you need to sort of live in the past for a moment to, to recapture the story uh, and disperse that with, with very present, present activities is uh, I think a, a great tip for sure. So yeah, we're getting closer to the end and I don't want to take any more time than I said I would, but if you had to define writing community, your dream, like what is, what is writing community to Joanne? Writing community is a community where I feel comfortable being myself. I feel comfortable sharing um, pieces of my heart and soul that I put on paper, um, where I laugh at different pieces of conversation that we have, where I get to where I get to read pieces of somebody else's soul and know that. I can be a part of their story and help them make it better and clearer and feel validated for the great things that they're putting on page. That's actually a really important part. 
being a critique partner, being a good critique partner, giving good critique that helps people. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you. You right. right? And that kind of um, thing is really important to me. And, and just having that accountability, right? This is what I need to do this week. This is my schedule, right? My list of chores for the week and I have to get them done. That's key as well. I didn't think of this before, but for some reason, while you were talking, it, it, it triggered me to think, how, how is the kind of support and, and everything that you get from writing community different from the, the people around you? I mean, you have a, a nice, beautiful, big family, right? And so how do, what, I guess, needs does a writing community serve outside of that can your family sort of be a stand-in for that or is there just certain things that it's like it doesn't overlap and and family and friends and and things of that nature right well I have one friend who I used to teach with who I can talk to about writing and the rest of my friends are not writers I have a friend who's a flight attendant I have a friend who um stays at home with her kids. Um, My sister is a teacher, second grade. So I don't really have anyone else in my family. My husband likes to write, but I lose my patience with him. (laughs) Too much, right? Live with him, you're married to him. It's (laughs) it's just too much. It was like when we were younger and my mom would be like, why can't you help your brother with his math homework? I'm like, it's too much. It's I love him, but he's driving me crazy. I would have patience for days with everybody else. This kid, no. (laughs) That's funny. That's exactly what happens with my nephew and my niece. He can come over and help my daughters, but his sister, no. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know if it's like you have higher expectations or what, or it's just all of the baggage. It's all of the other baggage. Oh my goodness. So Joanne, this has been wonderful. I, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, that I want to ask you. Um, but is there anything else that you want to share while uh while you're here? No, you know, the only thing that comes to mind is I remember a couple of people in the group were worried that they were going to read my memoirs, right? As opposed to a piece of fiction. Oh, and yes. so Right. And so yes. that, um, that I feel like I've, I've helped people yeah. overcome the fact that it has, that it's different somehow, right. It mm-hmm. still needs to work as writing. It still needs to work as, is this clear? Do you see the theme? Do you see where I'm going? Is everything cohesive? Right. But for some reason, people have, put memoir outside of the writing categories of fiction or poetry or you know um, I don't know whatever else there may be and it made it its own entity but really it's it is a form of you know nonfiction, and it has to be creative and it has to it has to still go through a, a process and mm. everybody has been a good reader Oh, that's great. I don't want people to be afraid of, of critiquing memoirs anymore. <laughs> that's no, that's a really great point. I forgot about that because we had had the conversations leading up to the critique about how we all write in different genre. We write in different categories. Um, we're going to read. We're going to be readers and and say, you know, what works, what doesn't. And if it's not the category or genre you typically read, uh, let the person know. But otherwise, you know offer what you can. And so everybody was sort of comfortable with this idea within the realm of fiction. And then you came in and it was like, wait, 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 I didn't agree to nonfiction. Now I'm going to be critiquing someone's life. You know, like that's kind of what I think was an underpinning fear for many um, people, but also, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how, quote unquote, how to write memoir. But um, yeah, as critiquers, I think it's first and foremost, we show up as as readers, right? You know how to read different things and, and see things. But yeah, you do bring a great point of, you know, memoir is creative nonfiction, 
So we still need all that, all those creative elements, the theme, the, you know, the story arc still has to be applied. And even though it's like uh, what, what you lived. So did you find any one tip that you were giving over and over, or was it just sort of putting people at ease when it came time to do the reading? No, I think just showing up and turning it in and then they would read it and they realized whether they, or I, I would say they would do it and whether they realized it or not, it didn't matter. Okay. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Very cool. Very there was cool. just one person who I felt like I had to put her at ease. She seemed very apprehensive of, well, if this was your life, then this is how it happened. Right. And so yeah. she would sort of hold back from that real critique. Um, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. That's I it. think that's, that's typically the, the block that comes up there. It's like, I, I, and I think with, with early memoir writers as well, that I have to write it. This is exactly what happened. Here's the play by play. Um, and then, you know, just finding the way to story as like, okay, we have to now really paint the picture for the audience. So, um, yeah, so that's really great. I, yeah, I, I completely forgot about that, but you're right. That was, that was definitely, uh, an issue that was raised. All right. So this was, uh, this was wonderful. We have, I, I'm, I really am always curious to ask everyone, but I think I already know your answer to this. We have five different types of meetings that we have throughout happy campers. Would you say that, well, what would you say, Joanne, has been the most valuable for you? <laughs> uh, it's a tie between um, the, the story discussions that we have where we talk about plot and what we can do to tweak things and the critiquing days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. 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 Yeah, the critique has been huge. Ugh, awesome. Alrighty. So we have the iconic backpackers stories. That is your Instagram handle. That is also it's dot com. That's your website and blog, iconic backpackers stories.com. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Is there anywhere else we should be sending people right now? Or that's where they will find Joanne and all of her lovely writings. <laughs> that's where you will find me, yes. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for uh, coming and interviewing and, and helping me uh, see writing community from all different aspects. Um, but yeah, this has been this has been really wonderful. And I, it just going through the whole memory of how you came into Happy Campers and and how it I, I love that it was exactly what you needed at that moment. It's really, really been great. So Yes. And we are off to a whole new season. Exciting. Exciting. I'm very excited and ready to get moving again. Are you, you're doing revisions this season, right? You're not going for a nano novel or you're just, you're, oh, but you're still in the memoir. You're still right. drafting too. I am drafting the last couple of chapters and trying to finish it. And yeah. And so then maybe with the, what I turn in, I might be turning in chapters that I have been working on and need the next layer on, right. but yeah. And so I, I you know, I'm going to ask this next Monday, but do you have, is, is your two month goal to be done? Or is that, do you have a deadline for yourself of when you want to be done with your draft? Ooh, I don't have a deadline, but that's a good idea. That's yeah, a really good idea. And, and Although I'm con concerned about the conclusion, I, I start thinking about how am I going to conclude, and then I freeze up. So maybe if I do all the outline, do all the chapters, and worry about the conclusion later, right? I'll have yeah. to write that down. I would say come up with a deadline for yourself, and again, it's it's a personal deadline, so it's you know nebulous. <laughs> come <laughs> up with a deadline for yourself as something to reach for. And then um, even if it's at that point, you have a sketch of the, the conclusion, then you're on the right path, you know, but just so you, you have something to work toward. 
you know, that you say, okay, by the end of the year or by, you know, February, whenever it is, I, I don't know how much you have left to go, but, but if you can put a date on it and just that, it just always helps with, with goal setting in general. If you have a date for the finish, then you can backwards plan uh, how much you need to do every single week, every single day and all of that jazz. That's very true. That's good. I'm going to do that. Okay. Then I will ask you again on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know my answer. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you, Joanne. This has been, this has been really good. I'm gonna... Thank you. All right. So that was Joanne Artman and that was a tiny taste of uh, Happy Campers Magic. If you want a little bit more of a taste, I've been doing a whole free week of Happy Campers um, right in Stop Writing Alone. If you're subscribed to the email list, then you've been getting the emails. Every single day of this week, I have done one meeting matching the meetings that we have done in the past. And if you're listening to this episode when it goes live, then that means you still have two meetings left. You can come to our Thursday meeting uh, this week where we're going to be talking a little bit about story structure, but also talking about uh, brainstorming and discussing our story idea and the importance of knowing how to answer the question, what is your story about? And Friday, we will be having one of our famous writing prompt parties to end off the week. If you have heard enough and you are ready to dive in for the two months ahead, there will be a link in the show notes describing everything that's um, going on for the next two months and how to sign up. Uh, if you are curious about the cost of this event, it is normally $555 for the two months of writing community five days a week, every single week from uh, October 4th through November 30th. But I've got an early bird price for anybody that signs up before uh, October 1st uh, for $444. So it is, uh, and it's an incredible value if you are looking for non-stop support and community face-to-face -face every single day, we are on a Zoom call together. We get to know each other's stories. We get to know each other's uh, hopes and dreams for that that story that you're writing now, but also for your whole writing life. You know, everybody is at a, a different place in their writing career. We have some people that are published. We have some people that are publishing as they're writing. Uh, we have people that are just getting started with drafts uh, for the first time, really seriously letting themselves, you know, giving themselves the time to write. We have people that have just started on their submission trail and just starting to get into that realm. We have people that write, as you heard at Joanne memoir, we have people that write fiction. We have people that write poetry. We have bloggers in our group. If you write, you're welcome because we're all here to support each other in whatever our writing journey is. That is the whole sentiment of the Happy Campers Club, that it is for all writers, because we get it. We get it. So if you're interested, the sign up is in the, um, the show notes for this episode. Uh, it's also, you know, in the Stop Writing Alone Facebook page. If you've signed up to the email list, you've already gotten it. Um, and if you hear this episode when it goes live, uh, then you still have time to actually partake in the Happy Campers Club uh, experience for free for the rest of this week uh, before we actually launch the private community um, that starts on October 4th. We have our own private Facebook group. And the group also has a, a what we call the Zoom room. Everybody has access to the Zoom account that I hold 
so that in between the meetings that I host, the community is always welcome to use the Zoom room for their own write-ins, their own discussions. And uh, I absolutely love it when the community takes advantage of that. So that is everything that's on the table, I believe. Um, but like I said, the best way to sort of experience is, is to just dive in. So uh, yeah, this this will be it. By next week's episode, uh, doors will be closed. So, of course, if you have any questions about it and you want to talk to me directly, uh, please feel free to uh, either private message me on um, Instagram at Stop Writing Alone or uh, on Facebook uh, through the, the Stop Writing Alone group or page. Uh, the My email is stopwritingalone at gmail.com. Any of those spaces... You can reach me if you have questions about uh, what is going on in Happy Campus Club and whether or not it's a right fit for you at this time. So that is all for this week. Thank you so much. And I look forward to sharing even more of the Happy Campers with you as we move forward. Everybody's got a different story of where they're at in their publishing journey and their writing journey and their experience with writing community. And I think it's just going to be a, a wonderful uh, ride for everybody. So have a fantastic week. Thank you as always for listening and happy writing. I'll talk to you next Thursday.